Hi, I'm Robert Earl White with the Order of Light here today to present The Wall of Secrecy, a peek at the truth about extraterrestrials visiting planet Earth by Michael Talpaz. Before we start this journey that is truly out of this world, I would like the viewers to know how I came across this personal manuscript also signed by Michael Talpaz III. It all started in 1991 when my family had a UFO crash behind our house covered up by the men in black, Air Force, and the local Coast Guard. Michael Talpez III was one of the three investigators who worked with MUFON, the Mutual UFO Network, and wrote these articles about my family's case. So, I was on a search for the truth to find more information about my family's personal experience. In that search, I was looking for manuscripts and books or anything that would have been written by Michael Talpaz III. My girlfriend was fortunate enough to find this manuscript online, which is actually signed by him. This was his personal manuscript. Our hopes was that we could find more information about my family's UFO crash case, the Lower Alloways Creek Incident. If you would like to see that documentary, go into the description and you will find the link to my direct me. So we bought it, took a chance, hoping that I could find something. Once I received it, I went through it and unfortunately there was no information about my family's case. But make no mistake. The information that was in here is just as valuable, if not more. I would like to remind the viewers that this manuscript is written in 1992, going over a series of events throughout a 10 year period and sometimes much farther than that, going through the Apollo moon landings to the original moon landing in the early 1900s, from programs on the moon and Mars and the bases they have there, also some of the weapon technology that the United States military has been working on also anti-gravity craft. There are many big names in this manuscript, for example, Howard Hughes, George Hunt Williamson, and even Bob Lazar. Yes, Robert Lazar. This is absolutely fascinating, and my goal is to share this story with the world in hopes that we could have a better understanding of the wall of secrecy. Therefore, we can push through it and start to understand what is really lying on the other side of it. So with no further ado, I present to you the wall of secrecy. Make sure you hit that subscribe button and the like because you are in for a ride that is truly out of this world. Thank you. In a universe with so many unanswered questions, the vast stretches of the unknown and the unanswered and the unfinished still far outstripe our collective comprehension. We will shed light onto the darkness. We will explore the universe to find what is really out there. We are the disclosure. We are the order of light. The Wall of Secrecy, a peek at the truth about extraterrestrials visiting planet Earth by Michael Talpaz III. Introduction. Every researcher conducting a search for the truth in the field of UFOlogy eventually comes up against a wall of secrecy. Behind the wall resides the truth. Closely guarded by a group of individuals who have been made privy of this information on a need-to-know basis. Over the last few years, researchers have been deluged by a barrage of information and disinformation coming all over this wall. The usual method is that a researcher encounters someone who reveals that he or she either works or has worked for the United States government. The person goes on to claim that he or she has or has had a secret clearance enabling that person to be in the know about UFOs or extraterrestrials. As anyone who has read much of the recent popular UFO literature knows, 
these revelations border and in many cases cross over into the realm of the incredible. Disbelief is usually the end result. The story you are about to read, to the best of my knowledge, true in all respects. In an attempt to determine the veracity of the statements made by my sources, I have made every effort to corroborate this information through other independent sources. In order to protect the identity of my prime source of information, to prevent any embarrassment to him or his family, I've decided to keep his identity confidential. Until those privy to the secrets reveal either evidence of an extraterrestrial spacecraft or a dead or alive extraterrestrial, the information revealed in this report will no doubt be branded as hearsay and met with considerable disbelief. Since I have known my prime source for over 14 years, I am of the opinion that what he has revealed to me is the absolute truth. As far as I can summarize, he has no reasons to be fabricating such a profound story. I make no demand that you, the reader, believe what you are about to read. I only seek to make you aware of the information how you feel about this information, how it affects your life, and what you do with it is up to you. There is nothing so powerful as the truth, and often nothing so strange. Daniel Webster, U.S. Statesman, 1782-1852. Edward, the Prime Source. For this story, I've given my prime source the pseudonym Edward. In this text, we will call him Ed. Ed became 81 years old in 1992. I've known him since 1978. Today, in 1992, he remains in good health. I was not aware of his involvement with extraterrestrials until the year 1986. Ed is retired from active service in the U.S. military. He served 30 years and retired in 1961. He has claimed to me since 1986 that he has the highest security clearance anyone could have associated with the United States government. In 1989, he renewed that claim and stated that his clearance was reapproved by the United States Senate. He claims he has access to any U.S. government facilities anywhere around the world. December 12, 1986. On this date, while discussing another topic of mutual interest, I asked Ed if he knew about UFOs. He said, I do, and they do exist. He mentioned another planet on the other side of the sun that we cannot see, referenced the 12th planet, Zechariah Stitchens, Stein, and the day, 1976. December 18, 1986. On this date, Ed told me that he was involved in the recovery of deliberately left evidence from UFOs in the ocean. He claimed the U.S. had advanced communication as to where the material would be dropped. Some of the material required a crane to recover it from the water. See UFO ocean recovery corroboration below in the Thelma Dunlap narrative, which will be read later on. Ed said that the public is not being told the truth about extraterrestrials because they cannot handle the reality of it. We discussed anti-gravity propulsion, and Ed stated that he saw UFOs fly with right-angle turns. He claims he knows about anti-gravity propulsion. January 7th, 1987, Ed claimed today that he still works for the people in the U.S. government that he was affiliated with in the past. He says the U.S. is not sure if they are hostile or not. He stated that the Russians don't know as much as we do about the subject. He claimed the bottom line is the fear of panic by the public. January 12th, 1987, today Ed confirmed what longtime acquaintance of mine said around 1985. Ed said that we, the U.S. government, can stop an aircraft's engine in flight. Cooperation. On November 6, 1989, 
The Atlanta Journal Metro Edition published a front page article providing by the Los Angeles Times. The headline of the article read, Scientists Seeking Technological Fix for War on Drugs Ideas Include the Use of Lasers, Bacteria on the Jungle Laboratories. The article began with the discussion of the Los Alamos National Laboratory where a team of researchers led by Terry D. Bernards and John D. Emil produced a 16-page draft white paper entitled The Role of Technology in Special Operations, Low-Intensity Conflict, Counterterrorism, and Counterdrugs. The report was dated July 24, 1989. A cover letter was attached to the report, which was sent August 3, 1989, to the Senate Intelligence Committee and at least four federal agencies, according to the the article, researchers Bierce and Emil declined to discuss their proposal with the reporter. The article went on to state that the prospects for breakthroughs in drug detection lie in more aggressive approaches. One is called soft kill. The idea included in the Los Alamos white paper proposes to disable traffickers or terrorists by bombarding their vehicles with microwaves or gases. Even in low concentrations, the paper says, such weapons directed at internal combustion engines could leave cars and planes powerless. I was amazed to read such a public revelation of vehicle disabling technology actually developed and ready to be put to practical use. Any knowledgeable UFO researcher is well aware of the many instances in the past where UFO sightings involved vehicle interference, even crashes of military and civilian aircraft. Reference UFO reports involving vehicle interference by Mark Rogersher. Center for UFO Studies, 1981. In an attempt to obtain a copy of the white paper, I began on November 17, 1989, a long series of written correspondence with my congressman at the time, Christopher H. Smith, 4th District, New Jersey. On February 16, 1990, I received a telephone call from one of the congressmen Smith's aides. I was advised that the report was going from one committee to another and that they can't find it. I was told that I would be sent a copy when it was found. On May 10th, 1990, another aide to Congressman Smith in Washington contacted me and apologized for taking so long to find the report. He said that they couldn't find it in Washington, so he called Los Alamos, where he was told the authors of the report in question were out of town. On May 24, 1990, a letter was sent to me from Congressman Smith. In it, Smith proudly enclosed a copy of the testimony by Dr. John Emil before the Senate Judiciary Committee on April 19, 1990. The report was entitled Science and Technology for Counter-Narcotics. The testimony was a sort of a sales pitch for the Los Alamos Laboratory. The report mentioned remote sensing and detection devices, raw material tagging devices, and money flow models to detect money laundering. Nowhere in the report I received was there any mention of vehicle disabling devices. Congressman Smith stated in his letter that according to Dr. Bierce, a colleague of Dr. Emilio, the report you described entitled Role of Technology was never more than an outline and was not completed. Copies of this outline are not available. On May 24, 1990, I wrote back to Congressman Smith expressing my dissatisfaction with the judiciary system report he sent to me. I enclosed a copy of the Atlanta Journal article proving the report in question was much more than an outline. 
Saturday, July 28th, 1990, I personally met with Congressman Smith at a one-on-one -on -one meeting session in Florence, New Jersey. I discussed my unhappiness with his efforts so far in attempting to obtain the Los Alamos report. He advised me that he would write to the chairman of the Select Committee on Intelligence requesting a copy of the report which was submitted to the committee. Congressman Smith sent me an original letter he received from Senator David L. Boren, Chairman, Select Committee on Intelligence. In the letter dated September 19, 1990, Senator Boren stated the full official name of the report in question. He stated this was a draft written by Terry D. Barriers and John D. Emile, dated July 24, 1989. I am not sure that this was ever published in final form. I recommended that your constituents contact the authors to see if this paper is available. On October 12, 1990, I wrote identical separate letters to Emile and Pierre seeking copies of the subject report. I reiterated that I was told the report was not classified and that its excerpts from it was published by the Los Angeles Times. I never received a response from either letter. I'm convinced that the information in the LA Times article was accidentally published and turned into to an embarrassing situation for the U.S. government. The wall of secrecy, although slightly damaged, was quickly repaired. The cat may have been out of the bag, but it was quickly put back in. April 22, 1987, I showed Ed a magazine article about magnetohydrodynamics propulsion for submarines written by author C. Clark. Ed claims MHD also works in the air. I asked Ed if he'd ever ridden in a military flying saucer. He said no, but he claimed to know what they look like. Ed had confirmed to me in a previous conversation that the U.S. government has duplicated the extraterrestrial spacecraft and built their own. Ed was asked if Howard Hughes' organization was involved in the building of military flying saucers. Yes, he answered. They had a lot to do with them. I asked Ed, was this because Hughes could keep it secret? He answered, yes. Corroboration, Howard Hughes and Thelma Dunlap. How I was led to Thelma Dunlap. In September 1987, I obtained a copy of Howard Hughes and his flying boat, Charles Barton, Aerotab Books, Inc., 1982. In this book, Mr. Barton writes at a great length about Carl Bamberger, Howard Hughes, Chief of Aerodynamics. On page 239, Barton writes some of the projects Bamberger worked on with Hughes after after the flying boat and the F-11 XF-11 photo reconnaissance plane looked like a twin fuselage U-2 with twin reciprocating engines indicate Hughes' concern with future trends. These projects include a nuclear power airplane, a feasibility study of using hydrofoils to cross the Atlantic at 100 miles per hour, and the design of a specialized submarine. This data was from a conversation between Barton and Bamberger on March 11, 1979. In September 1987, I called Charles Barton, who lives in Arlington, Virginia. Telephone number 703-538-5505. I asked Barton if Hughes and Baberger were involved in the MHD spacecraft propulsion. Barton was not sure. He advised me to contact Baberger at P.O. Box 786 Canyon City, Colorado. Telephone number 303 I called Bob Berger the same day and told him I was referred to him by Barton. I mentioned the quote above from Barton's book and asked him, Did you ever work on a magnetic propulsion spacecraft with Hughes? Bamberger answered, no, not to my knowledge. It may have been done since I've got out working for Hughes. We never got into it. It won't happen soon. I then asked him,
them about submarines and UFOs propulsion. At that point in our conversation, Babberger right away said to contact Thelma Dunlap if I wanted to know anything about UFOs. Before I present information about Thelma Dunlap, the researcher is directed to the book titled Future Magic by Dr. Robert Forward, Avon Books, 1988. Dr. Forward obtained his bachelor's in physics in 1954, a master's in applied physics in 1958, UCLA, and his PhD in gravitation physics in the University of Maryland, 1965. Dr. Forward worked as a senior scientist on the director's staff at Hughes Research Laboratories in Malibu, California. He worked as a private consultant to the U.S. Air Force, carrying out contract studies on advanced propulsion concepts, including antimatter propulsion. On pages 126 to 132 of the book, Forward discusses the theory and method of building an anti-gravity machine. He claims one can be built, but the technology required to build one is not here right now. On page 127 of the book, he actually provides a drawing of one complete with a notation at the bottom of the sketch, which reads, Hughes Aircraft Company. Baberger and Forward both seem to imply that anti-gravity propulsion is not in use today because of our technology is not advanced enough today to produce a working device. On September 5th, 1987, I called Thelma Dunlap. I described to her the circuitous path that led me to her. She advised me that Carl Baberger was a classified designation he can't talk. Thelma Dunlap was a criminal investigator for 38 years. She also worked for Union Oil Labs. She worked for the Federal Bureau of Investigations, FBI, and other investigative agencies around the world. She was 82 years old in 1987. She claims to have done archaeological research. She claims to have worked with George Hunt Williamson for the last nine years. Dunlap claims that Howard Hughes was involved with the MHD propulsion. She claims to know today, 1987, that Howard Hughes is not buried in his grave. She claims to be aware of an extraterrestrial spacecraft that was recovered off of the coast of New Zealand. She did not state what year it was found. According to one of Hughes' biographies, one of Hughes' favorite movies was Ice Station Zebra. The plot involved satellite photo reconnaissance. Dunlap claims cameras have a lot to do with it. UFOs, Dunlap stated, Hughes had a lot to do with cameras and satellites. Lights. The last time I spoke to Thelma Dunlap was on November 28, 1987. She claims that the U.S. government has military UFOs. She says that she has seen them in photographs. This claim corroborates precisely with recent allegations of U.S. government's craft by John Lear and Robert Lazar, and etc. And yes, Bob Lazar. Apparently, she died in 1989. Robert Gilrard of the Octorious Book Service in 1990 sold her library together with George H. Williamson's in January and February catalogs. One last bit of corroborating evidence of Howard Hughes' involvement with MHD and anti-gravity propulsion can be found in the book Flying Saucer, Serious Business, Frank Edwards, Batten Books, 1966. On page 127 of the book, Edward claims that in 1958, numerous companies in the U.S., including Hughes Aircraft, were participating in all-out effort to penetrate the secrets of gravity. May 5th, 1987. According to Ed, crashed and recovered UFO debris is stored in secret locations around the world. He stated that he could probably take me to see the material, but the government is afraid I would tell people about it. He claimed that UFOs can travel under the seas. He stated that other scientists have seen this hidden material. 
November 4th, 1987, I brought up the name Eric Henry Wang and confirmed that Wang was involved in the construction of military UFOs. He says Wang have may been killed mysteriously in a car or airplane crash by the Germans as some sort of revenge. Wang originally came to the U.S. in 1942 from Austria. A detailed obituary can be found in the April 1961 edition of Mechanical Engineering Magazine, page 132. Cooperation. Detail cooperation evidence of Dr. Eric Henry Wang's involvement with military UFOs may be found in the UFO crash at Aztec, William S. Stein, Weldon Stevens Publisher, 1986. See pages 369 to 371. November 17, 1987. I told Ed about my recent conversation with Thelma Dunlap. Ed claims to know her and said that she probably knows him. I advised Ed that I did not reveal his name to Dunlap. I mentioned to Ed what Dunlap told me about the recovered extraterrestrial craft found off the coast of New Zealand. When Ed heard that bit of information, he told me she should have been shot for telling me that. December 10th, 1987. Ed said that the U.S. can't defend against them. He pointed skyward. He claimed that they don't want us to go to their world. They want to control space. He claims the shuttle Challenger disaster was done to delay our space exploration. I asked Ed if the antagonisms between the U.S. and the USSR is really a charade and are their missiles in existence really to defend against them. I pointed upwards. Ed's answer, yes. March 2nd, 1989, according to a conversation with Richard L. Raka on January 18th, 1989, Raka claims that the U.S., Canada, and USSR each have their own military's UFOs. When these facts were brought up to Ed, he said the USSR and Canada had them for a long time. March 9th, 1989, Ed was asked if he would return with extraterrestrials to their planet of origin. Ed claims he has his name on the list of applicants to go for a long time. I asked Ed if Howard Hughes was still alive and he said he thinks he's dead. March 16th, 1989, I asked Ed if he knew Philip J. Klaus. He answered in the affirmative. I then asked him when the government was going to make the big official announcement about extraterrestrials. His answer was, by the end of this century. Ed said that he does not like the fact that the government lies a lot. May 22, 1989. Ed started the topic of government secrets today by stating, What we are doing on the moon is screwing up our weather here on Earth. Ed claims that the U.S. has an active manned bases on the moon. He claims there is an atmosphere on the moon, but there is not very much of one. He claims we... Humans were on the moon for the first time in the earlier part of this century around the 1900s. Ed claims that Neil Armstrong, the alleged first man on the moon, was aware of the prior landings. I asked Ed, why weren't we told about the earlier landings on the moon? Ed replied, a good goal in the 60s was to go to the moon. It would be bad to tell the truth. He confirmed that the hundreds of pounds of moon rocks returned to Earth by the Apollo missions were a joke. I asked Ed, what would happen if I reported what you told me to the U.S. government? Ed said they would deny it and say he's crazy. I found it quite timely that on July 20th, 1989, the 20th anniversary of the alleged first manned landings on the moon, President Bush proposed that the U.S. establish a base on the moon and send an expedition to Mars. Allegations have been made that man has already landed on Mars. Space experts predicted that it could cost up to $100 billion or more to return to the moon and up to $400 billion to reach both Moon and Mars. 
Critics of the plan in Congress, notably Representative Green, said, Given the federal budget deficit and earthly demands, I don't see how we can afford expensive manned programs in space in the near future. I guess that's why the alleged existing manned bases on the moon were built in secrecy. They knew they wouldn't be able to stand a chance against the current physical opposition. When asked whether the Apollo moon program was a stunt of little value, Neil Armstrong, first man on the moon, said, Even if it was a bad idea, I'm glad we did it. Many people doubt we ever went to the moon in 1969 for the first time. Bill Kaising, in his book, We Never Went to the Moon, Bill Kaising and Randy Reed and Impress 1976 claims that the landings were hoaxed or faked by NASA. He claims in the book that the probability of failure during the moon mission was so high that NASA did not want to risk the loss of many more astronauts. Three were killed on the pad in 1967. Casing claims that the landings were faked in underground facilities in Nevada. The book is fascinating and quite convincing. One of the most plausible arguments for the landings being faked is that the Lunar Excursion Modular, LEM, 30,000-pound thrust retro rocket engine, in all the released photos of the LEM on the moon, there is absolutely no evidence of a blast crater underneath of the engines or of any of the LEMs. If the LEM had really landed on the moon, each LEM engine would have blasted a substantial hole in the dust-like surface of the moon. Also, the enormous dust cloud generated by this engine would have settled on everything near the landing site, but no dust is evident on the LEM. I personally looked through many books about the Apollo moon landings. I could find no blast craters either in any of the many published photos of the LEM on the moon's surface. I guess the above allegations are a good reason why President Bush on July 20th, 1989 called the three Apollo astronauts three of the greatest heroes of this or any other century. It did take a lot of nerve to do what they did wherever it was, be it on Earth or the Moon. For additional cooperation of the Moon and Mars base story for the researcher is advised to read Alternative 003 by Leslie Watkins, David Ambro, and Christopher Miles, 1979. Ed also said that new planes in the future will go from here to there in a flash. Sort of sounds like teleportation to me. Ed was asked if extraterrestrials were in control or are we? He replied, I think we are. I asked if they were going to take us over and he replied, I don't think so. They're pretty friendly. March 27th, 1990, Ed advised me that there are limits to the amount of detail that he can tell people about his clandestine work. He told me that I was at the limit of what I'm allowed to know. Ed reiterated a previous statement he made that the big official government announcement about extraterrestrials would be made before the year 2000 AD. This is me speaking. Clearly, that has not happened. Continuing, as said, the news will be shocking. I personally feel they, the extraterrestrials, are in control in the sense that the U.S. can't reveal their presence until they say it's okay. Summary. The report you have just completed represents a summary of my attempts over the last five years to penetrate the wall of secrecy surrounding the truth about extraterrestrials. This quest has included reading over 150 books covering all aspects of extraterrestrials, in addition to many magazines and journals published by the UFO community. As a result of substantial amount of cooperation on my research has uncovered in support of my prime information source, I reiterate that what he has revealed to me is the absolute truth. There are revelations presented in this report, no doubt, that are quite shocking, especially to someone inexperienced with dealing with such a reality portrayed here. 
However, there are no more incredible than recent claims made by others in the UFO community in recent years. I'm confident that someday, in the not-too-distant future, the big official U.S. government pronouncement will vindicate the truth revealed in this report. Fear of adverse public reaction or even panic could delay this event indefinitely. Only time will tell.